Hi. Uh, th thank you. So I I'd like to talk about some tests that we can run on uh, small quantum devices. These, these are going to include tests of quantum physics. Uh, some of these are going to have applications, especially to cryptography. Um, and some of them hopefully will determine how we can help, how we can build uh, future quantum devices. But they should all be applicable to, uh, to near-term quantum devices, so very small devices, not the, um, sort of the Death Star quantum computer. Um, so let me just get started. The, the first test is, is of dimensionality. So when, we've ha when we have n qubits, this gives us a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. And perhaps this might seem a bit of extravagant, maybe even unbelievably so. Uh, a, one might hypothesize that nature is actually a bit more parsimonious in that uh, physically relevant states perhaps stay within a, a corner of this Hilbert space that perhaps only has polynomially many parameters, for example, states satisfying area laws. I'm going to try to test a, a, an even stronger hypothesis, which is that our n qubit system, the qubits are not in tensor product, but instead they're packed closely together, more closely together. Uh, and in fact, that these n qubits perhaps could live inside just a, a system of just polynomially many dimensions. Did, did, did you mean literally a subspace? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. Just a system of right, two to uh, all the states we can efficiently prepare our characterized by only polynomially many parameters, right? It's just that it's not a subspace. Yeah, I, I, I do mean um, yeah. a, a, a space of two to the n dimensions. Or, uh, polynomial mean, dimensions. You also mean the same space for all evolutions, for all polynomial time, quantum evolutions. Uh, I'll explain in a moment. <laughs> so let me, let me start with an example, uh, a classical example, so we can understand uh, the, the setup. Here, here's a memory card you can buy on Amazon. Uh, 64 gigabyte card. Before buying it, you might want to look at the reviews a bit because uh, here's a typical one-star review. Uh, he, he bought the card. It works fine up to about 10 gigabytes. And then it starts corrupting files. And I, I don't know exactly what's going on with this particular card. One hypothesis is, is that it's something like this. Uh, you plug it into your computer, it reports that it has 64 gigabytes of, of memory. But in fact, there's only maybe 8 or 10 gigabytes uh, inside the card. And it's sort of over, over using the, the same memory many times. <laughs> so, so there are uh, applications you can download to test for this kind of thing. I don't know if you trust the application any more <laughs> than you trust the, the card. Uh, but basically, one might guess the kind of test that, these, uh, so that the software could run is it stores uh, 64 gigabytes of random data into the card. And it reads it back off and sees whether the data matched uh, what, what it stores or not. And in fact, you don't have to read back all of the data. It's enough just to measure, say, one of, one of the bits at random uh, to, to see whether it was correctly, correctly stored. So we could, we could, of course, imagine the same thing happening quantumly, that our 64 uh, million qubit system is being packed into uh, just a much smaller one. But in fact, quantum systems can, can cheat in more interesting ways than the classical systems can. In particular, you can have two qubits that uh, are not entirely on top of each other, but they just slightly overlap. Uh, so mathematically, uh, what, what, what it means for qubits to overlap is that an operation, well, what, is, what does it mean for qubits to be in tensor product? It means that an operation on one of them can't affect the other. So conversely, uh, qubits that overlap slightly means that an operation on one of them can just slightly, perhaps by epsilon, uh, affect, the, affect the other qubit. So this is the definition of pairwise overlap. And allowing uh, pairwise overlap, allowing pairwise overlap epsilon, our first theorem says that you can, in fact, you can pack, you can pack n qubits into just polynomially many dimensions. Or more, more quantitatively, if the overlap is epsilon, uh, then you can fit in into n to the 1 over epsilon squared dimensions. And this is sort of a, by a random packing argument. Uh, so this shows, uh, here I'm plotting the overlap versus the needed dimension. Uh, th this shows that is, if the overlap is large enough, roughly more than 1 over square root of n, uh, then the number of dimensions can be much smaller than, than exponential. Conversely, we show that if the overlap is smaller than 1 over n, then the overlap, then the dimension really does need to be exponential. You can't have super small pairwise overlap in, in less than two million dimensions. In this, in this middle region, we're not quite sure. 
uh, so 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 that that shows that in in, in theory uh, many qubits can be packed into into um, just a few dimensions. Uh, we we also give a test for for seeing whether this happens in in your, in your real system for for verifying that your particular system does have exponentially many dimensions, and the test is actually the same as the classical test I just showed you, almost. So instead of storing n random bits, we store n random qubits, meaning either ket zero, ket one, ket plus, or ket minus. Then you retrieve or you measure a, a random one of those and, and see that it's what, what, what it should have been. And so our theorem says that if you pass this test with high probability, then the dimension has to be exponentially large. So uh, this factor of n squared is, is a little bit problematic uh, for, for small scale systems, but otherwise it's, it's it's a reasonable test, so, but there's, there's, there's some room for improvement there. And it's a pretty simple test to implement as well. All right, so the second test I'd like to explain is, is one for entanglement. Uh, so how do, how do you know that you, have an, that you have an entangled state? For example, a cat state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Uh, the simplest answer is to apply state tomography. So you can measure each qubit in the z basis or measure each qubit in the x basis. And if you measure them both in the z basis, you should get even parity. If you measure them both in the x basis, you should get even parity as well. Uh, and of course, this, this, this can be used for a quantum key distribution scheme, the, the same idea. So you, you have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they measure each of them at, at random in, in either the z basis or the x basis. And if they get the same answer all the time, uh, so, so you throw away some of the trials and to make sure that they're getting the same answer. And, and then, then on the trials that you haven't thrown away, if, if they've measured in the same basis, that gives you a random qubit that's uh, provably uh, secure from the environment because this, this state, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, is uh, monogamous between the, between the two parties. Unfortunately, state tomography is not the best way uh, for securely showing that you have entanglement. For example, if, if your photons, instead of being two-dimensional systems, if, there's actually, if they're actually four-dimensional systems, then they can satisfy these same correlations uh, without using any entanglement. So, so here's, here's one way that could happen. Uh, so in fact, not only are they four-dimensional systems, but they're four-dimensional classical systems. So they just store two bits in each, in each of these photons or in each of these uh, systems telling you what the response should be if, if, if you're measured in the z basis and telling you what, what the response should be if you're measured in the x basis. Uh, and it's the same for Alice and for Bob. So they always pass the test, but there's no entanglement. And this, of course, is, is rather bad uh, for security because it means that it, an, an adversary, Eve, uh, could, could know what the key is. Could just have a copy of the classical information. All right, so if we, if we, want, if we want to improve this, we, we can extend the game. Uh, so instead of just making sure that they give you the same answer when you ask them the same question, you can, you can ask uh, for correlations when you ask them different questions, when you ask Alice to measure in the z basis and, x to, and Bob to measure in the x basis or vice versa. Uh, and so we want their answers in this case to be the same, in this case to be different. This is called the, the, the CHSH game. Uh, and if, if the devices are not entangled, if they're, if they're classical, then they, they can only win in three out of the four of these possibilities, so 75% chance of winning. If they're quantum entangled, they can win for probably up to about 85%. So that gives you a 10% gap there that, that lets you um, really show that you have uh, an entangled system. The, the idea is you're going to run this, run this game maybe a million times, and if, if you win 76% or maybe 80%, at least 80% of them, uh, then that's fairly strong statistical evidence that, these, that the devices are not merely classical. In fact, this has been tested uh, fairly recently. Uh, this, this was in 2015 where they gave the first what's called loophole-free Bell inequality. And so loophole-free in this case means that they managed to get their measurement error and detection error below this 10% gap. And um, also that they managed, I, I guess, to do it with um, systems that are space, spatially separated far enough so that the speed of light uh, going from one to the other, the, the measurements are finished before uh, any possible coordinate coordination could, could have happened uh, between, the, between the two systems. Even more, even more recently, this has been, uh, people have tried to deal with the question of, are the questions into the system really, really random or not? Uh, and these, these are just sort of fun, fun experiments. In, in the first experiment, they point telescopes in opposite directions in order to collect photons that are um, certainly independent of each other, hopefully. 
in the second experiment, they have people press buttons. On, they had 100,000 people pressing buttons on their computers in order to generate randomness and test free will. <laughs> uh, so be it. So in, in, in fact, there, there, there's stronger tests out there. Uh, so, so this is the optimal quantum strategy. There, there's a theorem that says not only is it the case that, that better than 75% implies entanglement, but if you're close to 85%, so if you're 85% minus epsilon, then you have to be be, uh, behaving according to this particular quantum strategy. So you have to have a state that's about square root of epsilon close to that cat state, and the, and the measurements have to be square root of epsilon close as well. <coughs> and, uh, we can extend this test even further by playing many CHSH games in order to test not only that I have one bit of one qubit worth of entanglement, which is not so impressive, but to test that I have many qubits worth of entanglement, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, so so our, our first test uh, was the following theorem. That's you just play many games sequentially, and you're able to show that you have polynomially um, many um, qubits worth of entanglement. Since then, there's been uh, more more efficient tests for, for entanglement. Uh, th this this also does have applications. Uh, one one of the applications is is to what's called device independent quantum key distribution. So in in here, you want to establish a secure channel between two parties. Uh, and device independent lets us really uh, do this securely with only these four assumptions. So in particular, we do not have to trust that the devices are b behaving according to some specification. And in fact, the communication can be done even if your crypto devices have been manufactured by your adversary, made in China in this case. <laughs> uh, be because if, if, if the devices try to cheat, either you'll, de you'll, you'll detect it for, for sure. If, if, Otherwise, they won't be able to pass your test. OK. Um, and, and it also has applications even beyond this. So, so in, in terms of testing quantum devices uh, or testing quantum computers, so some problems you can check the answer. For example, factoring, you can, you can multiply uh, the factors together again. But for quantum simulation, it's not so easy to check the answer. Um, we come up with what's called a, a protocol for secure delegated quantum computation, which is built on this uh, sub-protocol of multiple CHSH games played uh, sequentially, and then has a few other sub-protocols as well. But our, our main theorem says that if, if you have two separated quantum devices, again, call them Alice and Bob, then you can, in fact, certify the dynamics. Uh, and it, this is interesting, in, in fact, I, I think, because Naively, you might, you might think that quantum devices are much more powerful than classical devices, and so they can cheat in many more, uh, many more complicated, many more interesting ways. Uh, but, but in fact, th this, this kind of theorem shows that uh, even though quantum systems are more powerful, you, you, can, you can give them more interesting tests, and this restricts them uh, more, more strictly than, than classical devices could, could be restricted. Uh, so, so in fact, untrusted quantum systems can be controlled stronger uh, than untrusted classical systems. I, I think on Friday there's going to be a, um, uh, a couple of talks that, that extend this and, and do have some better theorems for, for delegated computation. Uh, that's maybe not uh, a near-term quantum. Uh, a, a third test is, is of non-locality. So, so the reason people were interested at first in this CHSH game uh, was not just for, to test for entanglement, but, but was really to test uh, basic foundational quantum physics. Uh, so there's this question, does, does God play dice? Is, is underneath quantum physics, underneath it, is there a classical model that's actually deterministic? So you might imagine that inside this photon, when, when you send a photon through uh, polarizing filter inside the photon, there's just a long list, what's called a local, a local hidden variable model, uh, that says if I'm measured in this particular direction, this, this is the, the measurement outcome, and so on. And so uh, the test was or originally developed to uh, rule out these local hidden variable models, or, or what, what are called local realist models. Uh, so so uh, I'm this is the Einstein Podolsky Rosen local, local realism model. So local means that each party's result. Uh, depends only on that party's measurement setting. So there's no faster than light communication possible. Uh, realist means deterministic. So, so, so we've shown that there is a separation. One, one might ask, 
to, to extend this, what if there's an underlying classical model of physics that's local but not realist? So it's, a, it's a local and randomized. Uh, in, in fact, such models of physics do, do exist. Uh, there's one called uh, the popescu Warlick non-local box, or, or more generally, uh, a non-signaling classical distribution. And this is a box that wins the CHSH game uh, with probability one. And so in fact, uh, the CHSH game does not rule out a classical explanation. It does allow us uh, to have a, a non-signaling classical explanation. So we come up with a test to rule out uh, non-signaling correlations. In particular, we, we show that there exists a, a three-party game. In fact, where the, uh, quantumly, the three parties only need qubits, only need a cat state. So it's a, uh, not too experimentally challenging to create. Uh, where the best quantum strategy wins with probability about 92 or 93 percent, whereas uh, I don't know the best classical strategy. I guess it's probably 75 percent again, ish. Uh, but but the best uh, two-party non-signaling strategy is is only 87.5 percent. So there's about a five percent gap there uh, between the quantum and the and the non-signaling strategy. So so this hopefully it gives us a, a test that we can use to rule out this, this, this classical model, this, this potential classical model sitting underneath uh, quantum physics. Uh, and the game is very simple. It's actually just an extension of the CHSH game. Uh, the difficulty here is, is that, uh, so, so the model really is, is that each of these parties shares many um, either popescu warlick boxes or, in fact, arbitrary two-party non-signaling correlations. And they can use them in an arbitrary way, feeding the outputs of one into the inputs of the next in a completely adaptive manner. And we're able to rule out uh, this kind of strategy. Uh, the fourth test is of fault tolerance. Um, so so what's, what's the problem here? If, if we want to run a, a large-scale quantum, quantum algorithm, for example, Shor's algorithm, to factor a 1024-bit number, we need roughly uh, 10 to the 11 gates in that case, which means you need a, an error rate of about 10 to the minus 11, 11 per gate, which is uh, infeasibly low. Because in typical physical systems, noise rates are, t are generally around maybe a percent. Maybe in the future, they'll, they'll improve to perhaps 10 to the minus 4 error per gate. Um, fortunately, we can deal with this gap using software. So, uh, so you, using what's called fault tolerance. So instead of applying the, the circuit for factoring your number, you compile the, that circuit into a larger fault tolerance circuit uh, using a, a quantum error correcting code in, in a careful way. And in that way, you, you can reduce the effective noise rate per effective gate from 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 4 all the way down to 10 to the minus 11 quite, quite efficiently. Uh, so, so this is a, a rather amazing theory. Uh, we don't know what, whether it's actually going to work. It, it hasn't been tested experimentally, uh, really. Um, and so, so what, are, what are some of the problems? We, we, we have these theorems, these, these abstract theorems that say it should work, uh, but they're, they're on, they are only for I ideal noise models, which might not be the, the noise that actually rises in, in the physical systems. So in particular, some problems could be that the noise in your system has correlated errors instead of independent errors. And if the correlations are strong enough, this could break uh, our, our, our theorems. And so, and so it might be that actually fault tolerance is not possible and we can't build a large scale quantum computer. And an another possible problem is, is, is the, the noise uh, could be coherent in, instead of stochastic. So, so the difference is stochastic noise probabilities just add. If you have n errors at rate p, the probability of an error is, is roughly n times p. Uh, coherent noise, uh, the amplitudes add. So, so if, if you have n phases of angle theta, the total phase is n times theta, which means that the probability of an error goes like n squared theta squared. So it's growing qu qu quadratically, which means the threshold could be quadratically lower than we think. And so if we think that we can tolerate 1% noise, maybe, in fact, we can only tolerate 0.01% um, noise. So that would be rather uh, challenging for, for experiments to achieve. So that's, that's the first question. Will, will fault tolerance work? Which, and I, I don't know that we, we, we really know. Uh, a second question is, how will fault tolerance work? And at a very high level, you could say there's two 
uh, main approaches to, to fault tolerance. There, there's concatenated codes, which are good for low, low noise rates, and there's surface codes, uh, which are good if, if you have uh, limited connections. And which approach is better is, is not entirely clear. In, in fact, it's, it's much more complicated than this. So, so there's many options for, for, for building a, a fault-tolerant quantum computer. There's many codes to choose. For each quantum error correcting code, there's many ways of using that particular code, of doing error correction, of preparing the states, of, of applying the gates, and so on. And of course, it's not even that, even that simple, because it's not just choosing one code. You can combine different codes in, in, in clever ways. Uh, either by concatenation or, or even at the same time. So, so there's lots of, you, you can't say that one approach is better than another approach because there's lots of different regimes as well. So for example, you could have local gates, uh, geometrically local gates, or you can have, uh, for example, in superconducting systems, or you could have range gates, uh, which, which are more possible in ion traps. Or you might have fast versus slow measurements, or good versus bad memory, high or low rest errors, or um, or high versus low errors. So, so the scheme that you use depends on how, uh, even if you're below the threshold for tolerable noise, if you're well below the threshold, then, you, then you're going to want to use completely different codes than if you're, if you're quite close to the threshold. So, so all, 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 it's sensitive to, to all, these, all these possibilities. And unfortunately, uh, e even though ultimately we're going to have to build, engineer these, these massive quantum devices, it's quite hard to know where, where we're going to be and what we need to do, because simulations are, are quite difficult, um, obviously, because they're, they're, they're large quantum systems. And, and the analytical bounds that we have are, are generally too conservative. So, so the, the goal I'd like to propose is, is to test fault tolerance, um, and in particular to test fault tolerance on, on very small quantum devices, where, where we're highly qubit limited. So, so these, these kinds of near-term quantum devices. I, I think this is important uh, to test the theory, to show that the theory actually works with real noise models, not just, not just in theory. Uh, to, to see how well the, the theory works, to see how well the fault tolerance schemes work, and then hopefully to, to adapt the fault tolerance schemes and possibly to adapt the devices in, in the future uh, to, to the, to the to how well you, you find the, system, the schemes are working. Uh, this, this hasn't been done yet. Uh, just, I don't know, last week or a couple of weeks ago, uh, Flamia et al. Showed, showed, demonstrated uh, fault tolerance with an error detecting code. No, nobody's uh, d done it with, an error, with error correction yet, I don't think. Uh, and the basic reason is, is that it's, it's difficult, uh, and, you, and you need lots of qubits. So pr previously, for example, if you wanted to uh, store one logical qubit fault tolerantly, you could, you could use, for example, a seven qubit uh, Steen code, and then you, you're going to have to use more qubits for error correction. Uh, so these are called ancilla qubits, so 12 total qubits. Or you could use, for example, uh, encode this one qubit into the nine qubit bacon short code and then plus one for error correction. So overall, overall, still you need 10 qubits, which is not a tiny number of qubits in order to test error correction. Uh, we're, we're able to improve this. So we, we show that you can encode one logical qubit into five, the five qubit code, and then just have two qubits for error correction. So seven qubits total. So obviously, it's just a little bit smaller, but hopefully it makes it just a little bit more practical. Uh, or, or one into seven plus two, or say seven logical qubits into fifteen uh, plus two. And, and here, not only uh, can you can you encode the seven logical qubits into fifteen plus two, but you can also do uh, computation, fault tolerant computation on the encoded qubits. So we have maybe naive theoretical question, but these numbers of qubits, like fifteen qubits, and so don't don't we have? Quantum computers right now with 50 and 72 qubits. Like, it sounds like if we could, we could do it right now. I don't have a quantum computer with 50 and 72 qubits. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and actually, like, like the, the qubits, or the computers, for example, IBM's device uh, has, has a problem. Um, for one thing, the, the noise rates are rather high. Uh, but maybe, maybe that's OK. Maybe that's OK. Another problem is, is that you can't reset and, and reuse the same qubits right now. So, so you, you, you can measure a qubit and then it's measured for good. You can't, uh, you can't re, re, reuse it. Uh, when, once, they, once they fix that, then, then I think you can, you can start testing all, all these schemes. Well, there's also connectivity. Yeah, well, 
we, we, we have adapted some of these things with, with better connectivity. That, that, but that, that's also another issue. Uh, so, so the basic idea, um, the basic problem with fault tolerance is that errors spread. So for example, here, this, an error at this location could spread to, to multiple qubits. Um, previously, people have tried to avoid this. Our, our, our difference is that we don't try to avoid error. We don't try to keep errors from spreading. We just try to catch them. This, I, I guess, is uh, part of a, a, a bigger moral in fault tolerance uh, quantum computing, which is if you can detect errors, it's much better than if, than, than if you can't. And that, that's just what we're doing here. And although in this case, it actually re reduces the overhead instead of uh, increasing the overhead. Um, and uh, so we, we, we use this idea in, in a lot of different ways. And this, this lets us reduce the number of humans substantially. Um, all right, that, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. I think there are, and I, and I think there are uh, better examples than lots of things. And in particular, probably the, the, the nearest term quantum algorithms are going to be more, more like quantum chemistry algorithms that we saw yesterday, which, which require many, many fewer qubits. That was just, but, but they still uh, probably will, will, need, will need fault tolerance, but, much, but, at, but uh, uh, certainly at a smaller scale. So is this a VR box to a, a win the CHS game uh, with higher probability? Does this fall under any of the normal loopholes, or is this outside of the general loopholes that you think up in the bells and the Ah, yes. So no, it's, it's, it's outside that. It's, it's not considered in standard. So do you have a sense of what error rates are needed for these photon protocols that you mentioned at the end? Yeah. So. Um, we, we, we have simulations, um, and I, I think, let's see. So, all right, so we, we, we've done limited simulations. So, so the, the simulations we, we've done have been with non-local gates uh, and with, um, well, so we've done it with and without rest errors. So, so we're, we're extracting the synonyms one at a time, so, so rest errors are, are painful. Uh, w without rest errors, they're competitive with e everything previously. So it's, I don't know if it's 10 minus 3 or 10 minus 2. It's normal. It's kind of numbers. With, with rest errors, it's a, it's a little bit below that, but I don't think it's that much worse. Um, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's in like the appendix of our paper, but I don't remember. Yeah. Yes, reset, resetting the qubits is a major issue. Yeah. Um, do you have any way to quantify like, how many operations do you need in this, uh, of resetting? Do you need in these schemes? Uh, no, I, no I, th I think that's an interesting question. I, I, th I, th I think there's interesting questions here, which is, for example, we, we, we've just been trying to minimize the number of qubits that you use with fast reset. But you could also say, what, what about the question of minimizing the number of qubits that you use with slow reset, so you, you can't reuse the same qubits? Yeah. Um, we, we've looked at this for some problems, but not for all of them. It's, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. There's some interesting other variants as well. Uh, sorry, just, just to follow up. So yeah. if, if you take your scheme as is, then what's, is, it, is it a few resets or many, many resets per? Um, Well, I mean, for, for, for example, here, you, you need two qubits every time you, you extract a syndrome. And so the, when you extract the next syndrome, you're going to have to have reset the same two qubits or have four qubits. Two for the whole syndrome or two for one bit of the syndrome? 
Two. for uh, one syndrome or, or one bit of syndrome. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but, but just going back, you know, when you were just talking about error correction, you know, uh, encoding one qubit as, as nine or ten. Yeah. Does that, does that also require many reasons? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, for for example, in, in the in the nine qubit scheme, you're going to have to do it <laughs> twelve resets or ish. Uh, in, in in the seven qubit scheme, you're going to have I don't know six six resets ish. Yeah. 